Oh, ready? Good morning. Happy, Happy Sabbath. Sabbath. Welcome for coming. Welcome for everybody online watching. Just glad so everybody be here. Everybody have a blessed week. Amen. Amen. Good week. Another one to come. A little bit of rain out there. Get a little bit of drink for the earth, you know. Soak it up. Hopefully bring a little bit of green before it gets too cold. And uh, all the colors change. Well, the colors have been changing already, but... Just want to welcome everybody, have a good Sabbath, and um, got a couple announcements. Got a couple of first readings here. Uh, Thomas and Darcy Sidlow are going to be transferring to Granite Shoals Highland Lakes up in Granite Shoals, Texas. They moved and asking for a transfer, and then first reading for Lucinda Ford as a Pathfinder Deputy Director. And uh, so we got a first reading this week on that, and possibly next week, uh, second reading and voting, so... And now um, we're going to do a, open up in prayer. And also, if there's any praises, any concerns, any prayer requests, any burdens on your hearts, you know, think about those. Bring them to the Lord as uh, we open up in prayer here. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this glorious Sabbath, Lord, and this day to come into your holy sanctuary to, to give honor and glory to your name, Lord, to lift your your voice on high, Lord. We just ask that you just be with us and guide us. Lord, I just ask that you be with pastors. He breaks the bread to us, Lord, and, and feeds us your, your spirit, Lord. We just ask, Lord, that you listen to the hearts of the, your people, Lord, and just thank you for the praises and the answered prayers, Lord, and we just ask for your continued guidance, Lord, and that you just Listen to your voices, Lord, as, as we bring burdens and concerns to you, Lord. Just be with those who need healing, those who are lost and need guidance, Lord, who need your power and your strength, Lord. I just pray that you pour out your Holy Spirit and your grace upon each and every one of us, Lord. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Our first song is going to be Come Thou Fountain, if everyone can stand and sing along. Seal it, seal it for thy 
courts above. And the next song is going to be He Knows My Name. Happy Sabbath. It's really good to see you in the House of Lords morning. Um, today, today I would like to continue with a short series that we started a, a couple of weeks ago. Um, I believe that uh, repetition in many ways is the, it's the key to learning. Uh, when we hear the, the, the concept or the important concepts, one and you know, one and the second time, third time, it, it's a lot easier for us to grasp and to memorize and to apply whenever it's necessary. Um, if you were uh, here a couple of weeks ago, you heard the, the first installment of this series. And, and I would like to continue um, studying together this concept, this question that is making so many people upset right now. When we see that things don't, don't happen the way we expect it, when we get surprised by some unexpected negative things, we cannot help but question, where are you, Lord? Where are you, Lord? Are you there? Do you care? Especially now that Thanksgiving is coming, huh? Thanksgiving is coming, and... Uh, and there may be some people wondering, I mean, how could I thank a God that seems to have forgotten about my needs? How can I thank a God that seems to be absent in, in the lives of many people in the midst of a pandemic? And that brings an obstacle, that becomes a hurdle for many. And that's why so many people right now are upset at God. 
doubting him, questioning him. And there may be even some that have decided not to believe in him anymore. But I, I have to, to, to remind you that that is not the concept of God. Our expectations of God may create a God that does not exist. And today I would like to talk about those expectations and what is fair and what is biblical and what the Bible teaches about suffering, about pain. And where is God when all those things happen? So, I'm going to invite you to close your eyes and ask the Lord to guide us as we open his word in 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, but before we read it, let's talk to the Lord. Let's ask him for direction. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning with hearts full of joy because you are an amazing God. At the same time, many of us are facing questions. We know of people that are struggling right now and we, we wish we could be of help. So Lord, guide us as we study. If there is anything that you need to clarify in our lives, if there is anything that may be a, of a blessing for someone else, Lord, help us to understand it so we can share it, apply it, experience it. Lord, I humbly ask you to hide me behind our Lord Jesus Christ and for him to take over because we need to hear his words this morning. Lord, thank you because I know you care, I know you love us, and I know you will answer our prayer. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, through, I mean, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. May the pain and the grief of your trials, the tests, that you are experiencing result in praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. I recently saw a post, someone presenting their own opinion on why is a God allowed a virus to hit the planet? And in, and in this person's uh, idea, in his mind, he, he wrote something along the lines of, God is letting us know that this world is about to end. I thought, well, we know we're living in the, in the, in the end times, right? But then I saw the answers, the comments. How can you explain a good God that would cause this? Another person wrote something along the lines of, so you're saying that God is letting all these people die just to send us a message? Wouldn't it be a lot less painful if he, if he would put a commercial on TV? I mean, there's other ways to send a message across. The one that got to me is the one that said, don't even talk about God, because if he exists, he, it's obvious that he didn't care for my daughter who passed. My heart broke for this guy because I'm a dad and I love my kids. And this guy was asking a very fair question. How can you believe in a God who didn't answer that type of prayer, the desperate prayer of a father? And many of us may have been asking the same question. How can I be thankful to God 
How can I think of, of celebrating Thanksgiving and giving credit for, for, for the good things that I receive and focus on gratitude and thankfulness? If I am praying, if I'm trying to believe, but these things happen, how can I be thankful towards a God that does not answer my prayers? How can I believe in a God that doesn't seem to care? I mean, you can open... Uh, your internet browser and go to any news channel, any news page, and you hear of all the awful things that are happening. Another hurricane, another flood, another tornado. The numbers growing, people dying, hundreds of people suffering, kidnappings, murders, terrorist attacks, Senseless shootings motivated by racism or whatever. How could somebody do those things to other human beings? And how could God just stay silent witnessing all those bad things happening? Young kids being abused. People that we love dying. How could that happen? It doesn't seem fair. I mean, it could be something simple you're praying to God about. And you know that He can answer. And you know that He can do it. But He doesn't do it. Why? Why is it He's not taking the, the backache away? Why is it the headaches don't go Why is it he's not answering my prayer for my child, even though I'm trying my best? Why, even though you're trying to do what's best for people helping him and working hard, but everything seems to be getting worse and all you receive is criticism? Wherever it is, I believe you may start asking yourself, God, are you there? Are you good? I want to believe, but it seems like you are heartless. It seems like you are careless. If you have ever felt that way, or if you're asking those same questions at this point, I want to tell you something. You are in great company. Because in the scriptures, we find so many characters that ask the same questions that went through very similar, and even worse, trials in their lives. I love the fact that in the scriptures we find the narrative of the stories of individuals flawed human beings just like you and me. And I love the fact that God decided to register in the Bible those stories. The stories of pain. Think about David. I mean, David, if you read the Psalms, the, the man after God's own heart, he asks over and over again, where are you, God? Why don't you hear my prayers? Don't you see that my enemies are about to get me? They're after me? Are you even listening? You find another character like Job. Job. The oldest book ever written in the Bible is a story of pain. It's a story of Suffering is the story of a guy asking questions because he cannot understand. Even though he is faithful to God, bad things happen. Satan wants to attack him. So first of all, he takes his livestock. Then he takes his career. Then his health. His family's a wreck. His children die. He got boils over, his, over all of his body. His friends turn to jerks. Even his wife. His wife comes, looks at him and says, Well, Job, why don't you just curse God and die? How's that? For needing some marriage therapy at your lowest moment? <laughs> I mean, hey honey, just die. I'll be much better. Where are you, God? 
It doesn't seem fair. And you know what? The one that really gets me is the story of John the Baptist. Sometimes we don't, we don't consider his suffering much. I mean, we understand that John the Baptist came with a mission, and he fulfilled the mission, but, but have you ever considered his, his angle, his perspective on things, what he faced? I mean, he was Jesus' cousin. And, and he recognized that he had a very particular special purpose in life. He was supposed to prepare the way for Jesus. So he devoted his life to preach and let people know Jesus is coming. The Lamb of God that takes away the sin of this world is coming. Get ready, repent, get baptized. He is coming. And people start to follow him. And as people start to follow him, he tells them, don't follow me, follow Jesus. Get ready. He's so humble that he even says, I'm unworthy to even untie his shoes. That I cannot even do. He is the one that we've been waiting for. But then you see that John the Baptist gets arrested for doing the right thing. Thing. And while he's in prison, can you imagine what he's thinking? I mean, everything is going to be okay, right, Lord? I am Jesus' cousin. I've been serving you, God, all my life. I've seen your power, Lord. I know you can. I mean, Jesus has raised people from the dead. He's done some party tricks. He turned water into wine. I'm sure he's going to come. And, and then he hears rumors. You know, John Herod is thinking of getting rid of you for good. But I can imagine John the Baptist expecting for God to send Ten angels. I mean, ten angels would, would just, would just torn all, 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 all the doors apart and, and take him out of jail. Save his life. I mean, ten, just one would do it. So Lord, just send one angel. And he's going to make everything disappear. But nothing happens. I imagine, I wonder if John questioned, Lord, are you there? Is this real? Have I just wasted my time thinking I was doing your will? I think I did what was right, but... So as he waits in prison, at some point he asks one of his friends, Hey, please go, go find Jesus and ask him, Are you really the one that we were expecting? Are you, are you the one because he was doubting. Where are you, Jesus? Do you even care? So you see, whenever we experience those difficult situations, we are in good company. There's been many other followers of Christ. There's been many other faithful ones to God that have experienced this fear and pain and unanswered prayers. So in a few minutes, I, I, I just want to say two things. One, I will not be able to answer every question that you have. But I know that one day, He will. I don't know. My mind is too small. I'm limited, I'm too dumb, but he, he is wonderful. And he knows the end from the beginning. So the, the first thought that I would like to leave in your heart today is that when God doesn't seem fair, remember that God allows for bad things to happen sometimes, but, but he always has purpose. In pain. God has a purpose. He is still good. 
even though you're hurting, even when you don't see that he's working like the song, <laughs> even when we don't see that he's working, even when we, we don't feel that he's working, he never stops. He never stops working. I don't know what it might be. Maybe someone lets you down. Maybe someone that was important for you is gone. Maybe they broke your heart or maybe you lost them. Maybe a broken relationship. Or maybe someone is sick and is not getting any better. Maybe someone lied to you or, or took advantage of you or gossiped about you. Maybe that life is not what you expected. It could be that you're, you're facing a, a bad illness. It may be something as inconvenient as a sore throat that is now stressing you and getting you worried about what could be happening. Or maybe that, that you're facing an important date and everything doesn't go as expected. Maybe you're driving to that job uh, uh, interview and, and, and the tire goes off. I mean, you have to stop and, and, and rethink and, and, and find new ways to get there. Could be any number of different things. But whenever you're hurting, whatever level it is, however personal it may feel, remember that God has a purpose. He can use the difficult times to do something in us. In fact, I love how Peter put it. If, if you go back, if we go back to the, the, the verse that we just read, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Christ Jesus. This trials... The things that don't un we don't understand, those difficult seasons, will show that our faith is genuine. God is taking our roots even deeper. God is still in the middle of it. God is using it to provide more strength for what's coming. God is still in the middle of it. And if we just walk towards his presence if we give him a chance he will build something greater mind you god does not cause pain every single time but i know that god can use pain every single time to make us grow to help us be better in the middle of our pain, God still has a purpose. If we only give Him time, God has purpose in our pain. The second thing I want you to remember is that God is always present in our pain. He's always present in our pain. This week, Natalia and Sophia learned a, a memory verse at Evan Ridge Academy. I, as a proud dad, I recorded them and I posted it. But the first part of the verse, I love the first part of the verse. Psalm 46, verse 1. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. He is our refuge and our strength, and He is very present as we struggle ever present. He is with us. So often we want for God to give us what we want. But God wants to show us that He is what we need. That's a concept I, I shared a couple of weeks ago, but I, I want to I repeat it again. Education is all about repetition, right? 
So, God wants to show us that he is all that we need. God says, I am the source of which what you need. I mean, there's no better example for me in the scriptures than, than the story of Paul. When it comes to this, the story of Paul is just precious. Remember Saul? He used to kill Christians, right? That, that was his career. He, that was his profession before he was a professional Christian killer. But, but God found him and God transformed him. And he was radically transformed. And this guy did for the gospel more than anybody else aside from Jesus. <laughs> if you think about it, he started building churches, I mean establishing churches. He wrote a big portion of the New Testament. But then he, he talks about a thorn on his flesh. And we don't know exactly what that thorn was. We can guess. Apparently it was a problem with his eyesight. But obviously it was massively painful and destructive and frustrating in his life. So Paul writes and he says, I pleaded for God to take it away three times. I bet. Guys, I'm talking about Paul. Paul, the most prominent figure in the New Testament aside from our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul, begging God, please take it away from me. Three times. He spent seasons seeking God, humbling himself. I mean, you know, if God's going to heal anybody, he's going to heal that guy who suffered, who has been beaten and left for dead, who, who had been shipwrecked for Jesus, snake bitten, whipped so many times that his back is scarred beyond measure. A guy that was stoned for Jesus. Surely God will reply to Paul, right? But look what 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9 says. As, as Paul is describing his situation, he says, And God answered to me. And he said, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Heal me. Change my circumstances, fix my problems, relieve my pain. But God says, no, my grace is enough. This is what I need, God. But God says, no, I am what you need. I mean, this is something we cannot explain. It's something that we can only experience. You can tell your story to other people. But it'll, it'll never have the same impact as the impact in the life of that individual who experienced it. You know what I mean. You can tell your story to other people, and there may be some things that you can relate to, but it is very unique for each individual. You cannot put those things into words. You've been there. You know. You know what God can do. But Paul says, I asked God, and, and he said, My grace is enough. And then, and then he said in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9 and 10. Paul continues with his description of, of, of his personal situation. Therefore, he says, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. I delight in weaknesses. I delight in insults. I delight in hardships. I delight in persecutions. I delight in difficulties. For when 
I am weak, then I am strong. When I am weak, his strength is made perfect in me. When I cannot get on another day, he is there to carry me. He is always present in our pain. So you may say, I delight in my backache. I delight in my migraines because they've drawn me closer to Christ. I delight in that painful experience because that helped me to be more dependent. As crazy as it may sound, he was there. I delight in this lonely season of isolation because I had a chance to experience Emmanuel, God with us like never before. I delight in my job search because my God is truly the provider. I delight in this difficult season because God is breaking down my self-sufficiency and training me to depend more on Him. Here's the bottom line. You know, for, for some of us, all we see is the present, the now, the thing that we're facing, right? This week, on Thursday, I, I received a notification of some memories. You know what Facebook does that it reminds you of where you were three years ago? The things you saw, the people you met, the things you, you posted. Maybe it was a devotional thought. Maybe it was a Bible verse. And you're like, oh, that was four years ago. So it went on and on, and I just kept sharing, remembering some of the good times. You know, I, I was in England four years ago. Pictures of my daughters. But you know, I realized that back then, I had no clue where I would be now, today. As much as you can enjoy or suffer this day, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We don't. We only know this moment in time, right? But we must recognize that God has been there in our lives through the good and through the bad. If you walk through with faithfulness. Some other people ask still, and I've mentioned this before, why is that God allows for bad things to happen to good people? I, I don't know about you, but I, I'm not a good person. What, pastor? But you're a pastor. Well, I don't get it right all the time. I make bad decisions. I'm a sinner. How can I call myself a, a good person? And if you think you are, you're lying. You may be better than other people in, in your eyes, but it makes no difference. You and me were still bad. So the question should be, why do good things happen to bad people? Why is that good things are given to people like you and me? And you may say, well, Pastor, yeah, but my life is not incredibly blessed. Well, I... I beg to differ. Because if you are here right now, it's because you are healthy, I hope. <laughs> You're not in a hospital, right? I mean, if you look around, if you look to your right, to your left, there's people that care for you, there's people that love you. I mean, if you drove over here to church this morning, or if you have a vehicle parked 
on your driveway at home, if you're watching online, you are part of the 5% of the richest people in the, on planet Earth. Well, but it's a 1977 classic. classic. It's a classic. If you've got a toilet that flushes, that's a really, really good thing. Much better than what a lot of people in the, in the world have. You get to come to church and worship God. I mean, there are a lot of things to thank God for when you recognize that God does a lot of really good things for bad people. Like you and me. And, and, and you may argue also, well, Pastor, but the thing is that God is not fair. And I'm going to tell you right now and remind you, no, he is not. What? Pastor, you're in a role today. You're saying too many crazy things. It's the truth. God is not fair. He is not always fair. He's always just, but he's not always fair. If God was always fair, then he would give us what our sins deserve. But because he's just, he sent Jesus so he would pay for our sins. And it's not something I came up with. Come on, it's in the Bible. Psalm 103. God does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. He doesn't give us what we deserve because he's a graceful God. And he's not fair, but he's just, and he is loving. You know, often we wonder why is God is allowing for these things to happen. And, and we ask these questions from, a, from the wrong angle, from the wrong perspective. We ask those questions from this earthly, very limited perspective of things, you see? I've shared this story before, but I'm a, I feel like sharing it again because to me, it, it, it just tells of, of how different perspectives can be. I told you that when our dear little Sophia was one month old, she was diagnosed with something weird happening. And, and, and there were, the, the diagnosis was scary for us. So we rushed her to the hospital and my heart was beating fast and I was really worried. I mean, we had just gotten them. It was, it, it, we had them for a month, and, and now she had some weird thing, and, and, and her, her temperature wouldn't go down. And, and then at some point, the nurse said, we need to put an IV. And, and uh, like, an I, IV? Have you seen their little hands and their tiny little veins? An IV? And she said, help me hold her down. I remember holding my little Sophia down, and she grabbed my thumb. I didn't know a little one could squeeze that hard. My, my thumb turned red. When I tell her the story, she does it again, and she still has quite a grip. But I was holding down my little daughter. I had to put my arm around her and, and, and some of my weight just to hold her and down a bit. I could not explain to her at that age why is that I had to hold her down? Why is that I had to hold her tight and put some weight on her as she was experiencing pain? Because that nurse poke and poke and poke and couldn't find a little vein and she was supposed to be an expert. She had to call another lady. And to be honest, when I saw her, and forgive me, young people, I was thinking, maybe you're too young. 
And I was relieved when the door opened and an older lady with white hair walked through the door. I was like, yes. She's what we need. And she nailed it. First try. Praise God for experienced people. But I could not, I could not explain to my little daughter, to my little Sophia, look, this is for your own good. Look, you don't understand now. You don't know that you have an infection and, and they need to treat it. All she knew was that the guy that was supposed to protect her was holding her down while she was being poked. And I wonder how God feels when you hurt I can tell you that God hurts with you. There's times when God may want to tell you, look, I'm going to allow this, but I'm going to do something through this. There is a reason I'm, I'm working through this situation, and you are not alone. He did something that was not fair, he sent his son to die. And when Jesus became sin, Jesus looked at the Father and said, my God, my God, why did you turn away? Jesus knows. He knows exactly the feeling of frustration, of despair, of desperation. And the father knew he could not look upon sin. But because the father loved you, he sent his son to die in your place. That is love beyond anything that we can ever imagine. See, our God is not a careless God. Our God is not a heartless God. The complete opposite. God doesn't even just love you. He is Love. Love is not just what he does. Love is who he is. I'd like to read from Ellen White, Manuscript 76, 1903. And also from February 20th, 1902. She writes about that time when the sanitarium, the place that was helping so many people, burned down. So people were questioning why is that God would allow for that to, to go down in flames. She writes about this situation. It says, Our Heavenly Father does not willingly afflict or grieve the children of men. He has his purpose in the whirlwind and the storm, in the fire and in the flood. The Lord permits calamities to come to his people to save them from greater dangers. He desires everyone to examine his own heart closely and carefully and then draw near to God, that God may draw near to him. Our life is in the hands of God. He sees dangers threatening us that we cannot see. He is the giver of all of our blessings, the provider of all of our mercies, the orderer of all our experiences. He sees the perils that we cannot see. He may permit to come upon his people that which fills their hearts with sadness because he sees that they need to make straight paths for their feet, lest the lame, the lame be turned out of the way. He knows our frame. And he remembers that we are dust. Even the very hairs of our head are numbered. He works through natural causes to lead his people to remember that he has not forgotten them, but that he desires them to forsake the way which, if they were permitted to follow unchecked and unreproved, would lead them into great peril. Trials come to us all to lead us to investigate our hearts, to see if they are purified from all that defiles, 
constantly the Lord is working for our present and eternal good. Things occur which seem unexplainable, but if we trust in the Lord and wait patiently on Him, for Him, humbling our hearts before Him, He will not permit the enemy to triumph. The Lord will save His people in His own way by such means and instrumentalities that the glory will be returned to Him. To Him alone, alone belongs the praise. God desires to reveal His power in a marked manner through the lives of His people. There are many things we don't understand. But He who deserves all the glory and all the honor does. And He will take care of each one of our needs. Not necessarily according to what we wish. But He may give us something even better. And I finish with this illustration. It's an illustration that I, that I found on a video in Spanish. And I, and I want to share it with you. It's a story of a, of a lady that comes to a rabbi. And she's frustrated because she's been asking God for something in particular for years. And God has not answered the way she wanted. So she's hopeless. She's resentful. She's upset. And she tells the situation to the rabbi. And in the story, the rabbi says, I, I see and I'm so sorry. I feel your pain. I know you, you think that, that God is not listening to you. I, I, I see how you get the impression that God is not there. But let me ask you, the rabbi says, how would you feel if someone comes and gives you $10,000? How would you feel if anyone, if someone comes to you and gives you $10,000? And the lady says, whoa, whoa $10,000, I would be grateful. All right, so, gratefulness. So, how would you feel if, if in another situation, the same person owes you $20,000? But when they come to pay you, instead of paying you the $20,000 they owe, they just pay you $10,000. How would you feel? And she said, I would feel upset. I would demand the other ten k Right. When we get something we don't deserve, we get happy. If we understand that God doesn't owe us a thing, but everything we get in life is a gift. We will be thankful. When God gives you something, be thankful. If you want or need something, ask Him. But don't expect that He owes you so He has to give it to you. If He gives it to you, it's because he loves you, not because he owes you. If he gives to you, it's because he loves you, not because he owes you. I hope that changes your approach when it comes to Thanksgiving this coming Thursday. There's a lot of things that don't go the way we expected. But that doesn't mean that God is not there. But the complete opposite. God is there. You see, there's a lot of things that I have no answer for. But He does. So next time you question, next time you doubt, remember those in the Bible that went through something similar and probably even worse. But remain faithful, knowing, understanding that we serve a God of love. He is not loving only, He is love. That the Father has a purpose. And as His 
will is being accomplished. You and I are not left alone. Lord, where are you? And he whispers into your ear, here. In my grace is all you need. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, all of us have faced similar questions in our lives. Wondering why you allow for so bad, so many bad things to happen to us and other people. We look around and we wish we could have and find the answers. Forgive us, Father, because our minds are too small. Help us to lean more on you and grow deeper into you. Thank you, Father, because your grace is always enough. Because your grace is all we really need. Your presence is all that we actually need. So, Father, help us to enjoy your presence more and more and also as we get to experience and celebrate Thanksgiving with our loved ones, even if we're alone, Father, help us to remember that everything you give us is a gift, not because you owe us, but because you love us. Help us to be more appreciative, Father. And as we wait, for your will, your final will to be done. And as we wait for all this mess to finish, help us, Father, to rely fully on you and experience the fullness of your presence in our lives every single day. In the precious name of him who will soon return, in the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. And as we finish today, I want to remind you that if you'd like to support the ministry of this church, there's, a, there's an offering plate in the lobby. And also you can uh, support the ministry of this church if you contribute online. You see the information on the screen. Uh, or you can also send a check to the church's address. We're so grateful for what God has done and we're also grateful for what he is going to do. So I pray that that'll, that'll be our experience this week. Let's be thankful ahead of time, knowing that he will, he'll continue being faithful to us. God bless you, and have a happy Sabbath.